Good morning and welcome to Stapleton Church. How are you doing? My name is Matthew Dion, and today I am going to talk to you about sin, suffering, grief, pain, and punishment. Did I miss anything? Yeah, all right, get hype. Sin, right? Yeah. Um, so if you're, uh, if you're coming here from last week, you know, last week we were all joy to the world. This week we're kind of a bummer, right? Last week you got the cool mat. This week you get the evil twin. <laughs> what can I say? It's, um, I guess it's, a, it's, it's kind of an off week for us. Sometimes you got to send in the backup quarterback, but here I am. <laughs> in all seriousness, though, um, this passage, uh, this passage that we're going to be looking at today is an awesome, powerful passage, and I think that God has a word for all of us um, through this today. Uh, but we're going to dive into that in a minute, but first I'd like to share some, a personal story with you, if you don't mind. And you really don't have a choice because I'm the one with the microphone. Um, so I, I grew up in the church. I was raised going to church most Sundays, and I knew about Jesus, and I knew the right prayers to say, and and I um, did Sunday school, and it didn't make a difference towards uh, my teen and 20s years. I just, I was done with it. And um, I had walked away, and I was not going to church regularly. I wasn't saying the right prayers, and I was living in a way that I don't think uh, my Sunday school teacher, Mrs. Norman, would have approved of. But I, uh, when, when I went to go get married, um, my now wife of 15 years, almost this January, just in a, in a week or so, uh, my wife Melissa and I, we, we wanted to start out with a traditional wedding, and that meant we went to a church to do that. And I had uh, shared that with one of, my, one of my buddies, and he made the comment, oh man, they're not going to let you in there. You, you, the place is going to burn down if you even walk through the, uh, through the doors. It's a little extreme. Very funny, Mike. Ha ha. Didn't help much. I, you know, I, knew, I knew it was just a stupid joke, and he was just kind of being silly, but on some level, it, it kind of, you know, I, I was concerned. There might be some truth to this. Had I strayed so far away from God, had I messed up so badly that I didn't have a place there, could God actually accept me? Could he forgive me? Could he use me? Maybe, uh, have you ever felt like that? Maybe you feel that way this week or, or last week when you came and saw the cool Matt preaching. Um, well, I think we all feel that way to some extent. And um, the time that we're talking about, what we're going to be reading about today, is a time when the nation of Israel, the entire nation, was kind of in that place. Um, so so we're, we're in the book of Isaiah, and um, we're... The, the um, section of scripture we're looking at today is, is commonly called the suffering servant. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's even referred to as the gospel, according to Isaiah. Um, it's, it's, it's theologically complex, it's deep, it's beautiful. And I'm going to sum it up for you in five words by the time we're done here. One and a half chapters worth of scripture. I'm going to try to sum it up in five words. Um, but I want to give you a little background, though. So the nation of Israel, I said that they kind of were in a, a bad place. And Isaiah was a prophet to the nation of Israel during a very difficult time. See, if you know about Israel, God had chosen Israel to be his covenant people, his special people, representatives to the world. But they had rejected him time and time again. They ignored his laws. They hated widows and orphans and and, and, and despised foreigners, and they set up altars, idols, to these, these foreign gods. And even got so bad at some points that they sacrificed their children on those idols. They did awful things. And it was dark. By the time that... Uh, the, the Old Testament often refers to the relationship between God and his people as that of a husband and a wife, and, and more specifically, as a husband and, and an unfaithful spouse. And by the time that Isaiah came around, God was done, and he was filing divorce proceedings. There was a foreign nation that was going to come in, and they were going to conquer Israel, and they were going to exile the people, 
and things looked dark and bleak and awful. But there was hope. Isaiah looked forward to a better day. Isaiah saw that there was a Savior coming, that God had plans in the midst of all of this failure. And if you've been with us in the month of December for our Light Has Dawned series, uh, Pastor Matt, uh, the lead pastor here, has been going through the book of Isaiah and looking at what are called messianic prophecies. These are prophecies that look forward to a, a Messiah, a Savior that God was promising. In week one, Pastor Matt reminded us in, from Isaiah 7:14 that God was going to bring this Messiah as a baby. It's going to make us think small about the huge truth that he was unveiling, about the huge plans that he had. In week two, we looked at Isaiah 55, and we were reminded that God's word works. His word never returns void. It always accomplishes his purposes. In week three, we saw that in an unrighteous and dark world, that this coming Messiah was going to bring the birth of justice into our world. And in, um, and in the fourth week, that, was, that would be the Christmas Eve services last week, we, we learned that, that this Messiah was also going to be a dawn for our darkness, personally, the things that we struggle with. It's hopeful in dark times, isn't it? And then there's this. We have, uh, go ahead. we have the suffering servant. We're going to have a prophecy about a guy who suffers, and I mean a lot. How does that fit in? If, you have, um, if you've got a Bible with you or you have the Bible app on your smartphone, please feel free to open up to Isaiah 53. Um, follow along with us. Otherwise, the words are going to be on the overhead, so you can also follow there. Well, let's get started here. Isaiah starts out, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him... Oh, sorry. <laughs> went, went ahead. Isaiah had been among the people of Israel prophesying about the events that were unfolding before them for decades. They had witnessed these things happening. And so Isaiah's first question, his first thing is, have you been paying attention? Did you hear what I told you? Have you seen God's power displayed? You see, the things that were happening, good and bad, around them, that was God's will. That was accomplished by his power. And he had laid it out beforehand. And, he, and what he's saying is, those things were God's will, and what was to come next was. And then he starts talking about a person. He narrows the focus into this person. Next slide, please. For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. So the first part of this, he grew up before him like a young plant. This, this Messiah that was coming wasn't going to appear magically into history and just solve our problems. He was going to be born, and he was going to grow, come to age, and, and in front of, you know, where everyone could see, this could be the kid down the street, this could be your neighbor, it could be anyone. It's not necessarily this guy. We're not, we're not talking about uh, six foot three, I was correct, but I think I said six four last service, six foot three, Chris Hemsworth, um, Thor, demigod, shooting lightning bolts out of his fingertips. This is an ordinary guy. Could be you or me. And if we weren't paying attention we might miss this Messiah. So as we read on, we start to see what makes this Messiah, this Savior, different and distinct. And we also start to see why he's referred to as the suffering servant. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. So what we get from this is 
our Messiah or our, our, the person here has got a tough go of things, right? So, I mean, everyone's acquainted with grief to some extent. We know that. But a man of sorrows. People hide their faces. They won't even look him in the eye. He's got a tough lot. Okay. So maybe he's just kind of obnoxious. A lot of people are, you know, maybe he's got poor hygiene or something. There are lots of reasons why we could be despised and rejected. And, and you see, the thing is, it's in our nature, or at least for me it is, when we see someone suffering, someone seemingly punished, we assume they must have done something, right? You see a homeless man by the side of the road, and you say, yeah, well, he's probably got a drinking problem or a problem with drugs. You see, um, you're driving down the freeway, clipping along, and you see someone pulled over by the police at the side of the road, and, and um, even though you just slowed down from 97 yourself, you're looking at him and think, yeah, that'll teach you. He got you. He got you, didn't he? But that's not the case here. That's not the case with this man of sorrows we find. See, here, here we read in, um, in verse 4 and 5, Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. You see, we've all messed up, right? We know what that feels like, and we have a sense of justice. That kind of, you definitely see it when you see someone else mess up and get punished for it. You know, you, you, can, you can recognize that right away. But even for ourselves, when, when we mess up, there's this kind of pit in your stomach. You know, when they, uh, when they call you to the principal's office and all the other kids are going, ooh, you're going to the principal's office. We know that there's something, there's something to that. You're in trouble. When you're the one who's pulled over by the side of the road um, with the police officer shining those very, very bright lights into your rearview mirror, I, I don't know exactly why they do that, but you're, you're thinking, you know, that he comes and asks the question, oh, well, do you know what I pulled you over for? And you're kind of thinking, hmm, could be any number of things. What, 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 <laughs> how long were you watching me? There's that feeling in your stomach. You know that there was a... That there, there was a a misstep, you did something wrong, and there's punishment coming. But now we're looking at this person, and it's, it's, not, it's not anything he did. For some reason, God is pouring out all of the consequences for our missteps, for our sins, for our rebellion, onto this man of sorrows. If you could advance to the next slide, please. Thank you. Here it says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him, the man of sorrows, the iniquity of us all. Sheep is a term that uh, is used often in the Bible to talk about followers of God. And it's not a compliment. Sheep are kind of dumb. They're ornery. They wander off and get lost very easily. They need somebody kind of always around them making sure they don't do that. And they really have no natural defenses against predators. And we think, well, are we all like that? Do we all wander off? I mean, I, d I haven't set up an altar in my house. I'm not bowing before foreign gods, am I, really? Um, I'm not sacrificing my children, although some days... <laughs> Uh, I'm kidding, guys. I love you. <laughs> but here's the thing. When the Bible talks about idolatry. It's about anything that we cherish, we give time and attention to, we love, and sometimes, yes, even worship above and beyond or before God himself. There are lots of good things in our life. I mean, money, security, um, love, friendship, popularity, success, sex. None of those are bad things in and of themselves. But what happens is those things get into our hearts and they become the thing. 
And before you know it, we're willing to do anything to get those things. And this is what it's talking about here. We all, to some extent, do this. You know, um, maybe you've got to fudge the numbers a little bit to get that promotion. Maybe, um, maybe you're just going out for a couple of drinks with the guys, or, or, and it's, you know, nothing bad. It couldn't lead to anything You have a hard decision to make, and maybe you made the right one, maybe you made the wrong one. But those things, I think we have a sense, and, and we understand, we feel the, the guilt and the pain from those decisions. The earthly consequences, yes, but some of it, you know, it, it sticks around. See, but here's, oh, and, well, here's the thing. This man of sorrows, in some way, shape, or form, is taking all of that on himself. And, and if we think, okay, we were bad, we went astray, he's paying the price, that's not fair, he doesn't even complain about this situation. Read on with me in the next verse here. It says, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Now this... This would have rung a bell for the people of Israel. You see, they celebrated every year the Passover. And in the Passover, they would slaughter a lamb and they would eat it together as a family. They had a lot of rituals that went around of it, um, that went around that celebration. But it was a very important one because that was a commemoration of the first Passover when God delivered the people of Israel from Egypt. And in that, what they did is they slaughtered the lamb and they spread the blood over the doorposts of their home. And that was a sign for the angel of death to pass over their house. And so this is an idea that would have stuck in their heads, this idea of a sheep or a lamb being led to the slaughter. Paying for the sins, for the protection of the people. But Isaiah's Passover lamb here, it's not an animal. Isaiah's Passover lamb it's a person. Here we have, the, he was taken away because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion, and he was assigned a grave with the wicked. But he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. Let me just be clear. This man of sorrows was innocent. He's being punished for someone else's guilt. He's a picture of meekness as he walks willingly, knowing what's going to happen. And the thing is, we've all heard stories about people who are wrongly convicted, who spend you know, maybe 15, 20 years in prison before they're finally exonerated by DNA evidence or by something that comes forward but you don't hear too many stories about people saying, oh, hey, I know I'm not guilty, but I'm going to go serve your prison sentence anyways. He's walked willingly. Our man of sorrows, our man acquainted with grief has walked willingly into this. And so this is what he receives for all of his goodness. Our pain, our suffering, piercing for our transgressions, crushing for our iniquities, he gets our punishment and our wounds. So I've talked a lot about that. I talked about that feeling of guilt that we have, the punishment that we know is going to come, and, and earthly consequences, absolutely, they hold weight. Um, that feeling is, is important, but there's an even more important reality here is that when we choose to rebel against the almighty, all-perfect God of the universe, we effectively declare ourselves enemies of him. When you declare yourself enemy to the king, you are cut off. You're banished. You're put in prison. You're exiled. You, you deserve death. And, and this is the reality of our situation. We stand in this, in this tension, this relationship where we are guilty before God. We would be eternally separated him, from him. But because of this man of sorrows, because he took these things, we are not we receive peace, healing, and forgiveness.
what we still have to put together is how can one man's suffering possibly accomplish anything good for us? Somebody else can suffer all day long, and, you know, I might look at that and say, oh, yeah, well, that stinks, you know. And, but how can, his, how can this man's suffering accomplish anything for us? What kind of, what kind of man, what kind of sacrifice, what kind of person could possibly do something, take away the punishment I deserve? What kind of man, what kind of lamb could save me? 700 years after, after um, the prophet Isaiah spoke these words, John the Baptist answered that question for us by the Jordan River. Pointed to Jesus of Nazareth and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see, Jesus knew no sin, and yet he became sin for us. Jesus was silent when he was falsely accused, when he was mocked by religious leaders and the Roman officials. Jesus' side was pierced for us. According to, according to the Old Testament law, that to, to be hung on a tree or a cross, to be exposed and killed in that way was a curse. And Jesus died, the perfect man. The God-man died and was accursed and stricken for us. So what? Again, so what? He took, our, he took that pain, he took that grief, he took that guilt. What do we do with that? I promised you when I started out, and I was giving my intro, that I was going to sum up this passage in five words. And those five words answer the question, so what? Here it goes. It should have been me. It should have been me. When Jesus was falsely accused, when he was mocked, it should have been me. It should have been me. I'm the wandering sheep. I've rebelled against what I know God was calling me to do. That rebellion is called transgression, as in he was pierced through for our transgressions. It should have been me. I've got a broken nature that leans towards sin. It's called iniquity. As in he was crushed for my iniquities, for our iniquities. When Jesus was tortured and killed, that should have been me. When Jesus was pierced through, that should have been me. And it's not just me. My friends, it's all of us. It's you too. It should have been you. It should have been us. And it wasn't. And praise God, praise God that it wasn't. And so what's the point here? Am I trying to guilt you into this? Like if I can make you feel guilty enough about all the stuff that Jesus went through, if I can make you guilty, will you stay on the straight and narrow then? You make a promise. How's your last year's New Year's Eve resolutions coming along? See, that's not the point. The point here isn't about guilt. The point is this. The God of the universe, perfect, came down and lived a perfect, spotless life. He came down into history. He became acquainted with grief and with sorrow and with sickness. And then he bore our punishment. And why? See, it should have been us up there, but we never could have withstood it. But he could. He loved us so much that he bore that for us. And that should call us into awe and relationship with him. You see, the thing about that, the thing about this, it should have been me. Yes, Jesus was killed. He paid the price for our sins. But it didn't end there. The Lord was yet the Lord, yet God. And one of the things they teach us in Bible school is that when you see those words, that means something good's coming. Right? These circumstances, yet the Lord was pleased to crush him, that's Jesus, severely. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed. By the way, his seed, his descendants, that's those of us who are called by his name. He will prolong his days, and by his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. After his anguish, he will see the light, he will see light and be satisfied. 
by his knowledge, my righteous servant, Jesus, will justify many. That's us. And he will carry their, our iniquities. You see, the thing is, we can't, we can't bear those iniquities. We never could. And we don't have to. Jesus will bear them. We were destined to die. And but when Jesus died, when he was cut off, and he accomplished the Father's will, he's raised again from the dead in glory. He's coming back from the grave. And not only that, but those of us who are called by his name, we, we bear his name. We become his descendants. And we are raised in glory with him. Not just in some heaven far away in the future, but right here and right now. It should have been us, but it wasn't. And praise God for that. Maybe you came in this week or even last week and you're feeling heavy and you've got the guilt from that. You know, maybe you did, maybe, maybe you, you never got caught in that little indis- indiscretion after the work party um, and, and you never feel the consequences, but you, but you, you, the earthly consequences, but you feel them in your heart every day. Maybe you already suffered the consequences for whatever that sin is, but you're still feeling it today. Yeah, the consequences, they're hard. They can teach us and shape us, but they are hard. But what I'm telling you is that you are not guilty before the Father. You are not guilty before God if you have put your trust in him. So if you're a believer, if you've put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, I want to remind you of something. Romans 8.1 says that there is now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ. God's not done with you. He can and will use you. And he has a good plan for you. If you're coming in here and you don't know what that's about or how do you get this forgiveness or why should you even deserve it, the Bible says it's not hard. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's a journey, but that's where it starts. Claim Jesus as Lord. You'll be saved. We'll be raised with him in glory. I want to invite, um, I want to invite the worship team to come up and start getting set up. And, you know, I'm just thinking... If, and also, if we have some members of the prayer team or some elders or anybody who can kind of stand guard in the, in the back for us, um, I want to invite you all to lay down the burden of the sin that you've been carrying. If it's your first time, we're going to pray. And I want to invite you to ask Jesus to heal you. Ask Jesus for forgiveness. Admit that you're a sinner and, and start your journey with him. Um, you see, he, he does heal us in the here and now. He does change us. Fifteen years ago when I walked into that um, church to say my vows to, to my wonderful wife, um, the place didn't burn down. Nothing bad happened. Nobody kicked me out. And in fact, since that day, God has changed me into a new man. He's called me. He's led me. He's forgiven me and he's healed me in so many ways and blessed me in so many ways. And I'm not saying that it's just going to be a free ride from this point. But the thing is, God's not done with you and he has a purpose for you. And if you've never made that, if you've never made that plea to him, I want you to do that today. There's going to be someone back there to pray with you. I'll go back to pray with you during these last couple of songs of the worship set. Um, and if you have, and God's just working on your heart, you've been carrying something around, you're a believer, but you still have just this thing that's eaten at you. You're forgiven. I want you to go back and find one of us and let's pray together.
Let's turn our hearts to the Lord now. Father God, you are so good. We are guilty, and we've broken, we've broken our relationship with you. But you're perfect, and Jesus is perfect. And your love is amazing that you, that you would come down into time and that you would bear our suffering, God. Just draw us today. Holy Spirit, just draw us to you. Draw us to your grace and your healing and your forgiveness. Be with us. God, we acknowledge that we're sinners and that we need your healing and we need your grace. God, make us bold to accept that. Bring us into a sense of awe and worship of who you are and what you've done. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray.